So welcome everyone. Today we'll be talking about the state of publishing, some of our options and how to navigate the wild, wild west of self-publishing. As a reminder, this call is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording tomorrow, Friday, November, I'm sorry, October 25th, 2019. Um, if you've not already muted yourself, please do so to avoid any background noise. We love questions. Please find your chat button on your screen. It could be visible at either the top or the bottom when you run your cursor over that area. If it still doesn't pop up um, on my screen anyway, when you go to the top on the far right, there's three little dots that say more and you can find your chat under that and it'll pop up as a question on my screen. We promise to end the call today around 12.15, no later than 12.30, that's central time, so you can get back to the business of the day. So the following presentation is a portion of one that I'll be sharing at three upcoming events. The first is next Tuesday, October 29th, here in St. Louis at Beyond Networking. I'll be a co-presenter with Fred Miller on creating your personal brand through publicity, through publishing and speaking. I'll also be presenting November, Saturday, November 2nd at the St. Louis Writers Guild. And I believe that's at 9 a.m. I'll find out and make sure that I include those details in the email that goes out tomorrow as a follow-up. And then on uh, Thursday morning, November 21st, if you like to get up early for 7.30 a.m. breakfast at the Downtown Missouri Athletic Club, um, the business development group. So I will uh, put links to each of these events if you want further information about attending either of those events, you're welcome to join us at that. So I, I do wanna thank you again for re joining me uh, for today's presentation. Please drop your questions into the chat and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So those of you who know me for more than a, a year or so, may have heard me talk about how I grew up in Oklahoma. And if you've ever traveled through Oklahoma or parts of Texas, sometimes you'll see these signs that you see here, um, do not drive through smoke. And I vividly remember as a child, being in the back seat of my grandmother's baby blue Studebaker, um, it was probably dusk, the sun was setting, and all at once, you know, when you're, when you're a child, three or four years old, sitting in the back, you didn't really pay attention, at least I didn't, as to what was going on around us, and all at once I felt my grandmother, you know, slam on the brakes, and this was before seat belts were required, so I kind of go flying through the back seat, and apparently she had come upon some of this smoke drifting across the highway, and could see flames in the smoke. And so she decided it was in our best interest for her to slam on her brakes, turn around and take a different route. And I tell this story because quite often I see this happen in publishing also, where you're driving down a certain path and you, you think you know which way you're going to go to get your book published, when all at once either a, a someone, a person, um, or an article comes across your desk, or a slideshow presentation, someone starts talking to you. And there's so many options out there that people get very confused. And some of them can oftentimes be filled with what I call smoke and mirrors. And we're going to get into some of that buyer beware arena today as we work through our slides. Our goal today is to help you and let's see, why, why is my slide not moving? There we go, okay. Technology is my friend, I promise. So today's conversation, we're gonna talk about your author platform. What is that? How do you develop it? What are some of the publishing options you have in everything from do-it-yourself all the way to traditional and a bunch of stuff in between? What are some successful nonfiction topics? We'll also look at beyond nonfiction in terms of how to publish your blog posts or how to uh, perhaps build a business around a novel or something other than just a self-help book. And we'll take a look at author success stories. One of the things, if you hear me talk about publishing very often, I always emphasize 
that it's not about how well your book sells, but it is all about how well your book sells you. And that's the primary focus of what we're gonna work on today. So some interesting statistics that have come out recently. Um, over a million, let's see, that's a million, 9,188 ISBNs were assigned in 2018. Now, and that's just in the US, so if you stop and think about it, there's 45,000 plus people in the US that call themselves an author or a writer. And if we liken that to our own smaller communities, is you'll sometimes hear somebody says, well, there's a lawyer on every corner or there's a chiropractor on every corner. So the trick becomes, how do you help yourself stand out, whether you're a chiropractor or a lawyer or an author and a writer amidst all those other people that are claiming to do exactly what you do yourself? Some of the other curious things about this slide, some of um, you know, the, the increase in books being posted to Amazon has increased 28% since 2017. Now, ironically, the purchase of those books, the purchase of eBooks has gone down 13% in the same amount of time. There was a, an article that I read recently about millennials are actually moving away from the digital era and going back to things like typewriters and actual telephones on walls and trying to add things into their life and their living that's non-electronic. And so there is this trend to go back, and I kind of laugh when I say this, to the vintage world of reading paperback books or reading hardback books or using a typewriter. So it's curious to see where all this will end up a year from now. And because while eBooks is declining, there is a trend also showing that audio books is starting, are starting to increase. So when you build your author platform, it's another way of saying you're building your brand platform. I'm gonna just check the chat, the questions real quick. And I always like to say no two guys are alike. Here are three guys. One is Guy Fieri on the far left. He's the chef, you turn on Food Network and he's everywhere. I really, I mean, he's got shows constantly. Then there's the family guy. He has a different brand, so he's gonna have a different book. Guy Fieri's probably going to have a cookbook or a chef restaurateur guide. Uh, the family guide, his, his book is more than likely going to be a comic book, which is the one that you see here. And then those of us on the call who are old enough to remember Bill Nye, he's completely rebranding himself and actually coming back again and he, for those of us that grew up with him, he was known as Bill Nye, the science guy. And now um, he's coming back a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more educated. But the point here being is that no two guys are alike. And our goal in trying to identify your author platform and your brand platform is to identify which guy, in quotes, that you are. One of the ways that we help our authors do that is to develop your three-legged stool. And I can include um, a link to this so you can print it out in the email that goes out tomorrow also. Or feel free to do a screen capture and make your own copies here, whichever is easiest for you. But basically, we're going to walk through these three legs of this stool to help you develop your author slash brand platform as an author. Who is your audience? So the first leg on the far left is who is it that you help or who is your audience? Who is it that you want to read your book? If you're a, what I call a helper or a healer, which would be a, a doctor, a chiropractor, a, uh, a lawyer, an attorney, a life coach, a therapist, anyone who is helping someone learn something, a better way of living, a better way of cooking, et cetera. Um, you want to list those people that you help. If you are a novelist and your audience might be predominantly female millennials, then that's who you help because what you're actually doing with that target audience, people read books to find relief. People read novels to find relief out of their world, a, a way to escape. So if you're a novelist, 
and you're on the call today, you want to think about who is your target audience. That's what goes in this far left leg. In the middle leg is where we want to think about what are their now factors. So the acronym now stands for night owl worries. What do these people wake up? What does your target audience wake up in the middle of the night worried about? That's your night owl worry factor. If they are a small business owner, let's just use a chiropractor. We'll continue with that metaphor. If they're a chiropractor and they're trying to get more people into their practice, they're perhaps going to wake up in the middle of the night thinking about maybe it's finances, maybe it's um, employee retention, maybe it's how do I get more uh, patients, clients in the front door, um, how do I get more speaking engagements. Those might be things that they wake up worried about in the middle of the night. So you as an author, if that is your target audience, in the third leg of your three-legged stool on the far right, that's where we want to write, how do you offer relief for those night owl worries? So you may be a, if you're a financial consultant, perhaps you could help them take a look at their finances and, and work out a better solution for them. On um, If you're a employee trainer, perhaps you could come in and, and offer to work with them on an creating a more employee friendly environment. So the trick there is to, with this type of grid is who do you help? What are they worried about? And how can you offer relief for those worries? That gives you your author platform. That gives you your brand platform. So before I run on, I just wanna stop and see if anybody has any questions specifically about this conversation. Okay, I don't see any questions yet. Feel free to raise your hand or type in a question in case you do. So how does that relate to publishing a book? The very first question we always ask our authors is, who is your audience? It's, you know, what was it? What was the baseball movie years ago where, you know, build it and they will come. Um, and the, the farmer builds the, the baseball uh, fields out in his cornfields and people show up to play baseball. It doesn't work that way with a book just because you have produced a book and you have pages that have words on them and it has a spine and you've put it on Amazon does not mean that people are automatically going to, oh, there's that book I've been looking for my entire life and buy that book. The trick is to know how to put all the puzzle pieces together and I Whenever I have a conversation with a new author, I explain, we're not talking about 10 puzzle pieces, we're probably talking about 10,000 puzzle pieces. Of, and I don't say that to be intimidating, I say that to be realistic and that there's a lot of moving parts when you're going to publish a book and you wanna make sure you do it in an order that's going to help you put that puzzle together. I know when I um, sit down to do actual puzzles, similar to the one here, our methodology when our daughter was much younger was do the edges first, find the corners, build from there, find a way to make it easier on you to put that book together. So our goal here is to help you figure out not only what are some of your puzzle pieces that you want in your book, but then how do you also put them together? So as we're talking about the different types of publishing, and as we mentioned earlier with some of the arena being filled with some smoke, people trying to sell you things, either you don't need them or sell them, sell you more than you actually need or pretend to be selling you more and then you find out later on it's a bait and switch by a fairly highly reputable, what you think is a highly reputable publisher that you hear about all the time, um, when in actuality it may not be. So on this screen here, and we'll have several slides with like this as we go through the morning here. On the far left, there is, you can go a speed limit of approximately 20 miles an hour, and immediately on the far left down at the bottom is your traditional publisher. So we'll, we'll get into more detail of that here shortly also. As you work your way to the right and up, that line from traditional, independent, vanity hybrid, do-it-yourself and concierge, your speed gets much more uh, uh, expedited to where 
you're no longer going 20 miles an hour, a tiny little step at a time like a turtle. You're taking lar the further to the right you get on this chart, you're taking larger sprints. It, the process becomes more quick. You're able to get the book in hand much more quickly. So we're gonna talk about each of these independently here with traditional. So my intent is not to give you the ability to read any of this information. I'm going to explain it to you. There are approximately five or six traditional publishers that are still very active in the global publishing arena, and you'll see their names here. So it's Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, Macmillan, Simon Schuster, Hatchet, and Ingram. What you'll also notice in all these little spider webs underneath each of these major publishers is that there's a dozen or a gazillion, depending on your framework here, independent publishers who have actually been purchased by these larger publishers. And in actuality, when you work with these independent publishers, you are actually working with their, their much larger parent company. So there may be some benefits involved with that. Ingram, and you'll notice that I've isolated them in the lower right, Ingram is the primary distributor for all of those publishers that are um, indicated above in that tiny, tiny graphic, which means Ingram supplies distribution to every country, every continent, no matter where the book is printed. And especially here in the US, they are the funnel to get your book in excuse me, into whatever bookstore, whether it's in Scotland or Canada or Dubai or right around the corner in, you know, Mid-America, USA. Ingram is, also owns Ingram Spark. Years ago, it used to be called Lightning Source. So Ingram Spark is now um, one of the distribution channels that we use in order to help our authors appear as if they have been printed by a major um, publishing company. So I'm just checking the questions again. Remember, if you have any questions, please drop them in. So now with a traditional publisher, I was gonna see if I can back up. Hey, it works now. Okay, yeah, so with a traditional publisher and many of the independent publishers, um, traditional publishers will only work with you if you have an agent. So your first goal, if you want to try that route first is to Google book agents for your genre. So if you're doing science fiction, you want to Google science fiction book agents, science fiction publishing agents, and see what pops up. And then your goal is to start creating a relationship and find a way to get into those agents so that you can then have them represent you with that traditional publisher. Now, what will happen though is if you decide to go a traditional publishing route, a good rule of thumb for your profit for each of your books is probably going to be around 50 cents a book. Sometimes if you're much more, you know, if you're the um, John Grisham or the JK Rowling in your world, then you're going to be getting more per book. If you're just starting out, you might get a little less per book. So that's on the far left of these charts that we've been looking at so that you're, yeah, see if I can spin this here, you can see my arrow up in the upper left. The least percent of your royalties is going to be with a traditional publisher. Same for independence in that independence um, may let the agent go and you may be able to talk with them personally, one-on-one, -on -one, but they will also be keeping a larger percentage of your royalties. So as we scoot through here, now I liken the DIY, the do-it-yourself, we're going to jump to this real quick, because this is almost the opposite of traditional publishing is the do-it-yourself arena. I liken it very much to being a pastry chef, that if you are a qualified pastry chef and you feel comfortable making that cake on the left, as you imagine it in your head, then please go forth and do so. If you're not a trained pastry chef, you might end up with what you see on the right. The same thing can happen with the do-it-yourself publishing arena. Now, in that arena, you are typically working with Amazon, which is their um, publishing arm is now called KDP. 
about a year ago that switched from Create Space to KDP, and a few things changed with that. Um, you have Amazon distribution, which is great. It's a great one point of distribution. Keep in mind that Ingram is another 40,000 points of distribution around the globe. Now, Amazon does have a little button within their system that says expanded distribution. Keep in mind that yes, that is the Ingram distribution model, but if you click that button, you'll be getting less of a percentage of your royalty through Amazon than if you set yourself up with Ingram. So if you do choose Amazon and do choose the do-it-yourself do model, don't click the expanded distribution through Amazon. You want to create your own account through Ingram Spark in order to access that distribution. That way you're optimizing and maximizing your royalties. I see a quick question here. What approximately do book agents charge? Um, to get back to that, the it's going to vary, but they will take a percentage of your book. So within the traditional publishing world, you have your traditional publisher taking a piece of your pie. You have the agent taking a piece of your pie. You have the printing company taking a piece of your pie. You have your distribution people taking a piece of your pie. And you have your retail seller, whether it's Amazon or a brick and mortar store, taking a piece of your pie. So by, I didn't count all that, but that's about six or seven and you have the eighth piece of the pie. So you, you know that that publisher, the main publisher is going to take the greater percentage and then you're gonna get the leftovers. And it, it will vary on which publisher you go with and which agent you go with, how that works. The, uh, in, in retrospect also, the really nice thing about if you gain traction with a traditional publisher, that's when you start getting your upfront money. Um, and right now that word escapes my brain. I should know it if anybody knows it and wants to type it in. Be happy to share it where you're getting your, um, you're getting paid a fee upfront to pay the book and then they pay you a percentage of your sales. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Kay. Now with the do-it-yourself, you, whoops, let me go back. With the do-it-yourself model, you are, you are the publisher, even though Amazon is a publisher, you, you can use their ISBN number and they are the publisher. You're the writer, um, Amazon's a distributor, you do get to keep 100% ownership of your words. Um, there is the reduced royalties and depending on your expertise in book design and layout, that will determine the outcome of that book. Um, they have an online do-it-yourself service where you upload your files, you pick a photo or you include your own photo that you want for the cover, you pick a font, you designate where you want the title and the subtitle in your name. They print it and it gets um, added to Amazon for sale. That's the do-it-yourself model. So we've talked about the traditional publisher on one end and the do-it-yourself model on the other opposite end. So there's a bunch of stuff in between. Um, one of the arenas that we talk to people about is the vanity and hybrid publishing. So a vanity press, a really good example of a vanity book would be uh, a family memoir, a family cookbook. Uh, let's say you have a very large family and you wanted to print 100 copies of a particular cookbook where everybody's collected their recipes for you know, a family reunion or grandma and grandpa's 50th wedding anniversary. And there are a lot of printing companies who will take your Microsoft Word file or whatever you have put it together in and print that for you and help you put together a, um, a lovely book that you can hand out to your family and friends. That Vanity Press may or may not offer services to help you get that on Amazon if you decide you wanna make that available to a larger market. That's just something to think about. Now, a hybrid press um, could be a variety of things. So a, a hybrid press, might be a local printing company who also handles distribution and would then connect you and your book through Ingram as their way of offering you distribution. I hear a lot of crazy stories from people about misrepresentation. 
a printing company is a printing company. And if you work with a printing company to publish your book, and I put that word publish in, in air quotes, because, and I, and I love printing companies. I grew up in printing companies. It was my first job right out of college. So I have you know, a fondness for that industry. But a lot, I also know that a lot of those printing companies are looking for ways to survive in today's world. And in, some of them have switched their names. We're not a printing company, but we're a publisher. Technically, yes, they could say that, but if they're not offering distribution, they're just asking you to buy printed copies. And part of their sales pitch will be, the more you buy, the cheaper the per book price. And we're gonna get into a sample of that here in a second. Um, you, from the buyer beware perspective, just make sure that you read all the fine print, read all the contracts, make sure there are no overcharges, make sure that they're not trying to sell you quantity versus quality. Um, quite often those vanity and hybrid printers, they will not be offering marketing and distribution. And again, printers are not publishers. There is a website called preded.com and there is a book out called um, The Fine Print of Self-Publishing by Mark Levine. Both are really good resources to check if you've been approached by any publisher. Um, there is a, a well-known publisher who's very high profile in the New Thought movement, and that publisher has a tendency to promise a lot and not follow through or end up uh, nickel and diming you and charging you for every time you make a phone call or ask a question. So you want to be very careful about who you align yourself with if you're going to work with a vanity or a hybrid publishing company. One of the examples that I talk about, we had an author find us after she had already printed 3,000 books. Um, I call this my goose by moose story simply because it was a, a, a book about a holiday Christmas moose. Yes, it is cheaper if you take your book and have it printed in China. It's cheaper per book, but then you end up with 3,000 unsold books in your basement. And that's when she was referred to us to say, what do I do? Um, she did not have a website. The book was not even on Amazon. She had to completely step back and rethink, what am I going to do with all these books that are in my basement? Now, not only did she have 3,000 books in her basement, she had 3,000 stuffed moose because she had a very creative printing company who was able to also sell her a likeness of the main character in the book and package that as a, a book and an animal for a holiday sale, which is great, but they did not offer any support as to how to make that happen. So she, she did come to us, we were able to work with her and at least we got her a website, we got her a way to sell the books from her website, we got her on Amazon, and at least got her moving into a direction to where she could start selling those books out of her basement. Um, the, the other um, story that I, I wanna make sure that we include here about buyer beware is in talking about that high profile, very well-known publisher in the, in the New Thought self-help movement, one of the things that we've run across with that, and we had a client who decided to go with that particular publisher, and I had offered at no charge, I said, you know, well, let me help you read that contract and, and at least offer suggestions on what you should be asking. And I'm more than happy to do that if you feel that perhaps you have been approached by a contract or by a publisher and you're not sure whether they're legitimate or not. I'm more than happy to read that contract at no charge and give you a list of questions to ask that other publisher. The, everybody loves to hear the phrase, I'd love to publish your book. We want to publish your book. That's when, as an author, you need to just become, put on your buyer beware hat and think, okay, there's something in this for this publisher. And I don't mean this to be um, 
I, I don't want to diffuse anybody's excitement because there have been instances where people can get picked up by a national publisher and do have really good results. Unfortunately, there are just several out there in this smoke-filled buyer beware middle arena between do-it-yourself and traditional that we can't always trust. So, you know, my, my solution to help people through that stage is, you know, call me, let's have a conversation, let's talk about what you need to be asking them and find out if this truly is a legitimate request to publish your book. So then that kind of leads us to um, the far right, the concierge author assisted publishing, which is what we do. We are not publishers, but we set each of our authors up as independent publishers so that they get to Automatically, they keep 100% of their royalties, 100% of their profits. They keep their copyright. Uh, we've had instances where by not reading the fine print in a contract that um, there is a, a publisher that a lot of people use. Um, and I'm going to state facts here, so I'm going to go ahead and use their name. Um, there's a publisher called Author House and there's a publisher called Ex Libris. Both of those are buyer beware in that we've had authors come to us after having been published by one of those two publishers. And in order to get out of the contract, they had to buy the content of their book back. The actual words that they wrote to begin with, but by not reading the fine print in the contract that they signed, they in essence had given their rights away to their words. And that's when unfortunately you need to get a lawyer involved and it, it's not always a, a pretty happy ending. We have one now that someone just sent me their book who was published by Author House. And we're gonna go down that path and see what, what happens because they wanna pull it back and they've realized that they made a mistake. Um, so again, I open myself up. If you have a contract before you sign it, I'm more than happy to walk you through what you need to be asking that. So with concierge publishing, what we do is we help you figure out the best path for you. We help you avoid all that smoke-filled stuff that's in the middle arena between independent and do-it-yourself and help you figure out what's the best path for your particular book. We typically can make the process, we can make the process as quick as you are willing to work, um, but, but without sacrificing the quality. That's one of the things that we wanna make sure. When looking at all the different options that you have on what's next or what, what's your next step, it kind of depends on where you are. Sometimes we work with authors who come to us with an idea and we pair them with either a ghostwriter if they want someone to mostly write the book for them or we pair them with a writing coach if they want to write the book themselves but they need coaching on how to make that happen so that the book is readable so that the book does make sense, has a nice flow. Or maybe they come to us in their manuscript they feel is 100% complete, and we just need to pair them with an editor or a proofreader to get that book completed. And then we talk about their options in terms of printing. Um, when you print through Amazon and or Ingram Spark, you don't have to buy 3,000 books, you don't have to buy 30. You can buy one at a time. Most of our authors are also speakers and travel quite a bit around the country. So we'll, you can find us on any given day, you know, securing a hundred books to ship to Florida because an author just happens to be traveling through there and they have a speaking gig there and they want those drop shipped there for that event. Other authors like to keep, uh, stay local. And so they may keep, you know, 50 or so books in the back of their car for when they have smaller engagements or networking events. We help you think all that through. We ask the questions. I had a, an author one time say, Kathy, you, you gave me answers to questions I didn't even know I was supposed to be asking. And that's what we're here for. Um, we produce and help our authors publish over 50 books a year. Um, the, we're probably in the 200 to 300 range. Uh, we've been doing this 12 to 15 years, so we do know a lot of questions to ask. And we monitor the industry on a daily basis because it literally does change on a daily basis. So why would you even want to write a book? So if you are self-employed or a solopreneur, 
using a nonfiction book is a great way to grow your business. It'll build credibility. It helps attract more people. It grows your tribe. It positions you as the expert that you really need to be seen as. So it instills that perceived value. It helps you identify your audience, your niche. It gives you increased recognition. That's like, oh, they've got a book. And it also develops what I call JV partners. Uh, JV stands for joint venture. So it gives you the opportunity to say, you know, I'm a chiropractor, you're a massage therapist. We need to have an event and maybe invite a health nutritionist and invite a chef and, you know, we'll get all these people together. Those are your joint venture partners in creating an event or creating a webinar. Um, it's a way to build upon additional credibility, which then by developing JV partners, you're allowed to then share your information with their list and their contacts and everybody that they know now knows about you. So there's a, a very positive ripple effect when you start thinking about developing joint venture, joint JV joint venture partners. Yeah. So one of the examples that I like to give as how publishing has changed quite a bit. Some of you may know Martha Beck. Um, she's a PhD in social work and psychology. The book on the left was her last traditionally published book. And I used to know by heart who the Simon, it was one of those top six that we saw on that earlier side slide. The book in the middle is an example of a, a book of hers that was a collection of essays that was published by a traditional publisher. And then she pulled it back out and republished it herself, created her own independent publishing company and published that book herself. So now she gets to keep all the, the, the profits and margin uh, income on that. The, far, the book on the far right, Diana herself, is an example of how a traditionally self-help targeted type of speaker, life coach has She's, she calls it an allegory of awakening. So it's like a novel, it's a story, but built within that story is metaphors on life. So it may not be a specifically ABC, this is how you help people one, two, three type of step by step process, but it has hidden messages within that story. So it became a companion book. So this shows the difference between on the far left, she started out traditional and then she has moved more into, she's created her own publishing company and is now publishing her own books. So self-publishing is losing the, the negative aura that it used to have because it's become a much more professional route as to how to get your message out there. What we have seen with helping our authors and our authors can range anywhere from a professor in Vermont, he and his students were out on a, a field trip, literally a field, out in the field trip. One day he's a archaeology professor and they found a whale bone. They decided to write a book together. Um, we have a psychotherapist in Sacramento who she trains trainers in her particular philosophy and way of helping people. So she has a system. We've seen it narrowed down to what I call our, 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 th our three S sales funnel, the soapbox, and I'll explain what that is. Your, your book has a soapbox kind of feel. Your book has either a struggle feel or it could be a system feel. Either way, either of these three types of books for nonfiction offers relief, hope, answers, solutions. So we're gonna look at some examples of what that might look like. So for this particular, um, Jill Farmer is a former TV broadcaster here in St. Louis, and she talks about how she hit burnout. Um, she went, she quit, she took time off, time to be with her family, went through some additional training, and has developed quite a following as a um, professional leadership trainer in major corporations. And her brand that she has developed is based upon time management for real people. 
It's about how to get off the hamster wheel and step into the life you want. So her brand message, her author platform is this more freedom, more fun, more meaning. Um, her book is on the left. She does a lot of speaking. She does a lot of traveling and training. Um, one of the side benefits with her book is that she was also able to take a section of her book and one of her clients wanted to license that and use within their HR department. So if you're that type of author, what we do is we help you brainstorm ways that you can monetize that book other than selling it on Amazon. And back to the baker analogy, um, publish, self-publishing is a lot like baking a cupcake. The sprinkles on the top, that's Amazon. You're not gonna get a lot of wow for those sprinkles on the top. Now, if you're five years old, you might have a different opinion. But with, if you're actually going to take the time to bake your own cupcake, you wanna learn how can you monetize that book so that you're making the most money and you're not just stuck with the sprinkles on top of that cupcake. Um, Amazon keeps such a huge portion of each sale that you're really, your focus should not be on selling books on Amazon. It should be selling books to the general public or through your website because that's where you'll make more money. So an example of, so I'm sorry, Jill's was the soapbox of a, her, I'm sorry, her topics were, fell into more the category of soapbox and struggle. You know, she went through this struggle. She now shares that struggle as a learning situation for her and which has turned into a soapbox where she goes out and she helps people manage their time, uh, excuse me, on a corporate level in a much better way. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a quick sip. These two books will give you an idea of a soapbox. So the gentleman on the left, he's a um, New York, Miami, Paris modeling agent. And he works a lot with young women who come here from, um, as he calls it, third world countries. You know, they're looking for a new life. Um, they're very tall, they're very beautiful, they fit into the modeling world very easily and are, are highly welcomed here in the US. Unfortunately, they move here and they know nothing about how to get an apartment or how to get medical care, how to get insurance, you know, um, how to take a taxi. And he saw this and, and quite often he was there helping them clean up whatever mess they found themselves in. And he decided, no, we need a better way of doing this. So he created a nonprofit that helps them the minute they get to the US and helps them get set up with housing and teaches them you know, how to navigate New York and Paris and Miami and all these places, as well as where do you go to get, if you get sick, what do you do? So he has set up this nonprofit to help fund the education of kind of like the entry part, as well as, you know, if all at once they lose a job and he doesn't want them stuck on the street. So he has created, that's become his soapbox. He's not just a modeling agent, he's there to help them in life. The one, the book on the right um, was written by a gentleman here in St. Louis, and he is a former retired um, development director for the SSM hospital system in St. Louis. And he now uses his book and does many workshops to teach, many as an M-I-N-I, -I, small workshops to teach development directors of other nonprofits how to, um, create more money coming into their nonprofits. And so that's become his soapbox in retirement. These two are examples of a couple of struggle books. The one on the left um, was written by a young woman who at the age of 16 was able to struggle her five siblings, she and her five siblings out of Cambodia. And this is their story. Uh, she saw her parent, watched her parents get killed and it's quite an amazing story. And she now lives in Chicago and has completely turned her life around. But this is something that she wanted to share with the world to let them know that life can go on. The book on the right is, again, it's a local author here in St. Louis. Um, Ryan was born with a, a missing chromosome. I'm not a medical person. I don't know the techn techno terms for all this, but um, this book was compiled from a series of diaries that his mother and letters that his mother started writing when she found out she was pregnant with Ryan. So 
he was never supposed to live beyond the age of five. And this book was produced for his 25th birthday. And we took all of those writings, we, she paired with a writing coach and they helped her pull it all together for her book. And she now goes out and helps other people in similar situations and um, has conversations with them about you know, surviving. Then this, these are two books of a system book. So the one on the left, 52 Ways to Increase Your Sales. The one on the right, 52, this is a productivity coach, Powerful Success Strategies. Um, this is an example if you have a system and you have a process. It's a very great way. It's a great way to organize your book. And, and you don't always have to have 52. These people just decided these two people have decided there's 52 weeks in the year, let's do 52. I've had people use 13, I've had people use 17. Um, I had a woman, we had an author about a year ago who did 49 and I said, oh, come on, can we please just come up with three more? Uh, but no, she stuck with 49. So you're not bound to that 52. These are just examples of the soapbox, the struggle and the system type of um, outline for your book. So in retrospect, uh, kind of recap here, we've talked about traditional marketing, uh, traditional publishing, excuse me, the do-it-yourself opposite end of traditional publishing, the smoky gray area in between of independent publishers and vanity and hybrid printers, and then we've touched base on the concierge author assisted. Um, I'm checking the chat box. I don't see any additional questions. So the, um, the goal here is to, again, we don't want to plan your retirement plan around the sale of your book, but we do wanna help people realize that they can use the book, whatever book they're writing, to target whatever audience that they're targeting and help that audience solve that problem. So whether it's a soapbox of struggle or a system, or if you're a novelist, or if you're a sci-fi writer, or a young adult. We also do a lot of children's books. Wherever you are in that marketplace, there are ways to make money, and it's not just on Amazon. In fact, most of it's not going to be on Amazon. So Bowker, um, and you've seen me quote them a couple times throughout the presentation today, Bowker is the government agency oversees all the purchase of ISBN numbers. The ISBN number is that little barcode and number on the back of your book that's unique to each individual book. And I love this guy's name, Beat Barblan, but this is a quote that I love that he talked about, and by now you may have already read it, but he talked about how self-publishing is moving from that frantic wild, wild west space that we've talked about in that smoke-filled highway to a much more serious business where the trend that we see now is that the self-publisher is building their business around that book. The self-publisher is a business owner who just happens to be using a book as a way to help market themselves and their business. Those are the people that will end up making the most return on their investment for their book. So the, let's see if we have, don't have any other questions in the chat box, but, uh, one of the things, one of the links that you'll get tomorrow when you get the follow-up email, in addition to the three um, local St. Louis presentations that I'll be giving between now and the end of the year, is we'll send you a link so that you can, if you've not already done, gained access to this, to the top 100 book marketing ideas. We scanned the internet. We took the um, uh, oh, experience that we've had and what we've seen work and what we've seen work around the country with our different authors and compiled all those into, it's about 107, I think, top book marketing ideas. And that is a free download. That link will go out in the follow-up email tomorrow. Um, as a reminder, we are skipping November due to the Thanksgiving holiday. And, oh, I did want to also mention that there will be a link that for any of our listeners, if you want to schedule a 45 minute to one hour consultation, uh, free phone call with me, I offer that to anyone that joins any of our um, lunch and learns. 
that link will also be on the email that you get tomorrow. So our next Lunch and Learn interview will be Tuesday, December 10th. I know I don't want that to mess with anybody's brain, but we're moving from Thursdays to Tuesdays starting in December, mostly because all the holidays have been falling on Thursdays lately. So um, I think but Christmas is also going to be close to a Thursday this year. So we're just going to move everything to a Tuesday. We're staying um, 1130 to 1230, Tuesday, December 10th. I'll be speaking with Nadine Kuba about goal setting. She is a corporate leadership executive coach. And I was asking her about, you know, quite often we hear from authors, they want to finish their book. They're just not sure how, or they feel overwhelmed, or how do I make time for it? So we're going to be talking about getting unstuck um, moving beyond fear, finding your chutzpah to start and finish that next goal, such as your book. So be sure to bring questions. Mark your calendar. It's December 10th from 1130 to 1230. Bring your questions. We'll have answers. And again, thank everyone very much for being here today. If you have any additional questions, my email and phone number will be in the email you get tomorrow and feel free to reach out. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody for being here.